news of a brutal murder is always shocking. Corden has gone up around the building. Police said their search was still going on. He was maybe surprised at the amount of blood that that produced. We know that he's very manipulative and charming. But when the crime is committed by a cop, it seems even more horrific. Locals knew the couple had not been getting on, but no one expected anything as vicious as this. Nobody wants to believe that police officers are criminals. To die at the hands of the very people sworn to protect us is, for me, the ultimate betrayal of trust. This man has brought shame on the Met. He's got a very warped moral compass and probably has some sort of power trip and lust for power. In his mind, he probably thought, well, I'm a police officer, so I would get away with it. In this series, I'm going to unravel the outlandish plots, lies and deceit of officers who attempt to get away with murder. Stephen Jones was a celebrated police officer, cited for bravery. But on a cold January night in 1993, Jones's wife, Madeline, was found dead next to a crash car. It looked at first glance like a tragic road accident. However, the more officers investigated, the clearer it became that this was no ordinary accident. This was murder. 37-year-old Madeline was killed by her serving police officer husband, Stephen Jones, a high-flying hero cop with 17 years' service to his name. I think that what fascinates me the most about this case is how such a successful cop could commit such an awful crime. I've brought together a crack team of experts who will help me unravel what happened in each case and how the killer cops' training enabled them to cover up their crimes. Former top anti-corruption cop Julie Mackay, Serena Simmons, a leading psychologist, and Met murder detective Howard Groves, who helped solve over 50 murders. They are going to introduce me to some of the worst cases of killer coppers from around the world. Julie Mackay is a former detective superintendent that has spent a large part of her career dealing with bent coppers. And if anyone can help me understand how the mind of a bad apple works, it's her. So could you tell me about Stephen Jones? So on the day of the crime, he was at work, driving around, dealing with the public, responding to calls where people are perhaps reporting offences that have happened. But at the same time, he's using his police car to go and scout out how he's going to commit his crime later on that day. On the one hand, protecting the public and looking after them, and on the other hand, planning a crime that is going to destroy all public confidence in him and policing. So the first people that arrive at that scene, they assume this is this is just a tragic accident yeah so there's a, a couple driving along in their car and they come across this um her red little metro that's left the road uh, and she's by the side of it on the ditch and it looks like she's just had a crash what's gone on so they call the police when the police arrive there's a few things at play here aren't there number one she's dead yeah number two what's happened number three who is she? Yeah. Madeline Jones was quickly identified, and a man matching her husband's description was spotted near the crime scene. It's a bit of a remote area, but there was actually a witness that um, saw him fleeing the scene, and he was in his own car that looked a bit suspicious. When people turn up to uh, tragic accidents like this, do they usually go into in-depth forensics? In this case, it was back in 1993, yeah. and, and things were slightly different. So they would have gone up and had a look and thought, all oh, right, that's pretty straightforward. The car's left the road. She's lying there dead. The windscreen smashed. Mm, it's hit a tree. OK. So that first initial assessment, I think, was pretty straightforward. Do you think he relied on the fact of that time that they didn't really go into in-depth investigations of forensics or anything like this? He was probably using his police knowledge to think they won't look too deep into this. Do you think that's the case? I think that's exactly what he thought was going to happen. Wow. 
Stephen Jones picked what he thought was the perfect secluded location for a seemingly tragic accident. This was the scene. Madeline's red metro veered off the road into the remote Tinkersdale wood. John Schoen is a local journalist that covered this story back in 1993, and there's not much he doesn't know about the crime or the town. This is an area known as Deeside, an area that's a nice rural area close to an industrialised area. The area was regenerated in the 1980s, so there's a large industrial park close to here which employs blue chip companies. It's also an historic area because the uh, village of Harden was actually the home of the great Victorian Prime Minister William Gladstone. Tinkersdale Woods is well known uh, for country walks. Lots of people go there. I feel like I need to see where Madeline Jones's body was discovered and John has agreed to meet me there and talk me through just how a tragic car crash became the scene of a major police investigation. So this is it, John, this is, this is the crash site. This is the scene of the crime. So when police first arrived, what would they have found? Well, they found the car up against a tree. Uh, the, the windscreen had been smashed. There was nobody in the car, but when they went down a little bit further from the tree, there's a stream down below, and they found the, the body of Madeline Jones lying face upwards. Before the accident, Stephen Jones had made a call to his fellow police officers. He'd actually been in contact with some of his colleagues to say that he was worried about Madeline because she hadn't returned home. She'd been out to, to buy petrol for her metro car and hadn't returned, and he was worried, he told them. Where was she? Had she been involved in an accident? So to some extent, he, he'd laid the trail for what looked like an accident. To the outside world, Madeline and Stephen Jones seemed like the perfect couple. Madeline Jones, she was 37, a petite lady, only four foot 11 tall. She had a very kind and loving nature, devoted to her husband and also to her two children. Madeline had been married to her husband, Stephen Jones, for 13 years. Stephen was a well-known and respected figure in the community. Stephen Jones was a, a well-respected police officer covering the area where he lived. He was a, a giant of a man. Uh, people sometimes refer to him as a, a jolly giant. He was six foot one tall, weighed 19 stone, and he was a bit of a local hero. He'd actually gone to help a, a young woman. He'd gone into a local pond, uh, an ice-covered pond, and he'd gone in to, to help her out. He was holding her uh, for quite some time until the emergency services arrived. For that, he was commended. He was he was hailed as a as a hero. His picture appeared on the front page of one of the local newspapers. So he was very popular. You know, he was a guardian of the community, really, uh, as well as a pillar of the community, an all-round good guy, as you might say. But this good guy was hiding a dark secret. At 10.40 p.m. on the 3rd of January, 1993, the battered body of his wife, Madeline, was found lifeless in a stream. It's just quite eerie being here, just knowing that Madeline, Madeline's body was in the stream. And, and I've, I've got photos here of the, of, the, um, of the crash site, and I can see the car would just have been there. To all intents and purposes, it was a tragic road accident. Uh, but as time developed through the night after, uh, after the accident, the police investigators found that there were various things that just didn't add up at all. On a cold, wintry night in January 1993, the dead body of a police officer's wife had been found beside her crashed car. The assumption? This was a tragic accident. That assumption would be wrong. Local journalist John Schoen is walking me through the crash site. 
the first officers on the scene obviously were investigating what appeared to be a, a, a tragic road accident. There must have been a real sense of this is Stephen Jones's wife, the sergeant's wife here, that's, that's apparently dead in a stream. So there must have been shock. Officers immediately went to give their friend and colleague Stephen Jones the sad news at his home about a mile and a half away. But at the scene, things didn't add up. Madeline's body was taken to nearby Wrexham Hospital, where an apparently distraught Stephen Jones went to identify her. Meanwhile, at the crash site, evidence of foul play was being uncovered. I've asked former crime scene investigator Alex Izzett to take me through exactly what was found at the scene and why it didn't add up. What was one thing that was quite noticeable in the car itself was the position of the driver's seat. Now, Madeleine was quite short. However, this seat was quite far back. Now, looking at Madeleine, she's only four foot 11. There's no way that her feet could have reached the pedals, let alone her hands at the driving wheel. So all of that suggests that there was something amiss here. The evidence at the scene continued to unfold in front of the forensic experts. Looking at the vehicle itself, we're looking at the front of it and we're not seeing a huge impact there. So straight away, we're thinking, right, well, how did this vehicle get here? It doesn't seem that there was any skid marks, there wasn't any swerving on the road. And the speed that it went down the verge and hit the tree, it suggests that it wasn't actually going as fast as it should be. Looking at the victim and, and where they're positioned and the windscreen itself, we can see this person wasn't fell through a windscreen. The autopsy found that Madeline had only one impact that caused this trauma to her head. But also, if you hit your head on a windscreen and it's breaking, you're going to have glass on you and you're going to leave behind parts of you there was no glass on Madeline in her hair, in her skull that we would expect to see. However, looking at this windscreen, there was damage to it, but oddly placed, there was three sets of damage which would be radiated from the windscreen, breaking it apart. And in there, where we expect the holes to find the blood and the tissue, what we see is, is rust instead, suggests that a metal object hit that windscreen. away from the vehicle, away from the victim. A hammer was found in the undergrowth. Now, this was interesting. It seems quite out of place for, for where it was found. So this would also start alarm bells. So then, how did the body get to where it was? Well, there aren't any footprints. Well, there's no evidence of Madeline crawling out of the car. We would have seen that movement and when we get to the body and we examine it, we would have seen dirt on her hands, on her clothes, as she was trying to crawl away. But there's no evidence to suggest that. And then when we look to her autopsy, there's no evidence that she even survived to the point of being able to get out of the vehicle. The Home Office pathologist who examined the body, Dr Donald Waite, ruled that the death had been by blunt force trauma to the left side of her head by a rod-like instrument with rounded margins between one and one and a half inches in diameter. Something, in fact, like a truncheon. Madeline's head injury clearly showed that there was one instant where she had been hit. There was some trauma, but it was by one impression. Stephen Jones was arrested and brought to this police station for questioning. He was very clearly the prime suspect in what was now a murder inquiry. The question was whether, with the benefit of his police training, he'd been able to successfully cover his tracks. In the early hours of the morning, John got a call about the accident. He could smell a story, and he headed to the station. Well, I came down here because there was obviously something going on. Uh, the rumours were buzzing around. So I thought the best thing to do is just come down to the police station uh, and see if I could get some answers. 
to a, a senior officer who I knew very well, and I said to him, well, well Steve must be in, in peace. And he said, well, well, actually, he's in the cells. That was unbelievable, really, to hear that. And what happened next for you, then, once you found out that Stephen Jones was in the cells, surely everything then ramps up for you? I was down on the scene uh, when the police actually uh, were looking into his car, looking into the boot of his car, and I had a sound recordist and a cameraman with me, and the sound recordist said to me, I think they found a murder weapon. The police looked into the boot of the car. I was there when, when it was found. The cops had uncovered a metal truncheon, and along with that, they'd also discovered a blood-soaked bin liner and a police riot helmet. Now, obviously, this is a horrendous murder, whoever commits it, but the fact that it's a police officer that does this obviously ramps this up to another level. It's just unthinkable that a pillar of the community has murdered his wife in cold blood. Stephen Jones was confined to a cell, continuing to protest his innocence. And when the forensics examined the right helmet that was found in the boot of Stephen Jones's car, they found minute traces of glass that matched Madeline's car windscreen. The same glass particles were also found on Stephen Jones's clothes. Uh, he'd actually worn a, 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 riot, a police riot helmet as he drove the car into the tree to protect himself, of course. And that truncheon, which was also discovered in the boot of his car, was found to have microscopic traces of blood on it. So, just how did Madeline Jones die, and why? Detectives believed that Stephen Jones put his plan into motion earlier on the day of the murder, and the scene of the crime wasn't the woodland, but the Jones's family home. She's in the bath, and he's obviously gone out to his garage and got everything set up, so he's got his weapon out there, he's got his plastic bag out there, he's decided what he's gonna do. So he takes her, into the garage, and as soon as she steps into that garage, there he is, and he strikes her on the head with his steel truncheon. And he kills her instantly, right? Yep. One blow, and that's it. It seems extraordinary that a man with a seemingly impeccable police record, apparently happily married with two young children, could be capable of such savage cruelty. To shed more light on this case, I've asked former detective Chief Inspector Howard Groves to help. Stephen Jones was seen by many to be a pillar of society, but in fact, he had a devious and cruel nature to him. With 30 years' experience and over 50 murder investigations, there's no one better placed to walk me through the evidence. With Stephen Jones in custody, the police theories began to come together. If you had attacked her upstairs, you'd have to get her downstairs, leaving evidence and bringing her all the way out in, into the garage afterwards. So it was easy for him to attack her in the garage, where it would be an easier process of then getting her into the boot. So how did Stephen Jones lure his wife into the garage? He wouldn't have wanted to disturb the children in the house. He had to lure her into the garage and under the pretext that her brother was ill, having a heart attack, because he probably knew that she would be, where if she was having a shower or whatever, she would be straight downstairs and in the car and out. The way he murdered his wife was with a blunt instrument to the head. Yes. No, but it wasn't a standard issue truncheon he used. No, no, no. It wasn't a standard issue, no. The, the police standard issue truncheons are normally made of wood. And this, this item was made of steel, was it? Yes. It's a lot heavier and obviously one or two strikes of that, and nobody would withstand that. He killed her with one blow. Exactly, that's it. What, did he do? what was his next moves then? Well, he wrapped her head in a bin liner, and, and for the obvious reason, he didn't want to leave any traces of her blood in the premises or on his clothing, on his shoes. And then he put her into the car and then tried to recreate the road traffic accident, which he thought would be the thing that would um, take the police on a completely different route. And, not realise that he was actually the person who had killed her. So Stephen Jones, being a police officer, would have been around traffic accidents. So he, he would have been using his knowledge here. 
When you turn up at a road traffic accident, nine times out of 10, you're not thinking of something criminal. Something has happened that was not foreseen. And therefore, it's investigated in a completely different way from something which is obvious, like a murder or a serious assault, where you know something has happened that's criminal. So that's the difference. He knew that the officers would be kind of blindsided, hoodwinked, into thinking this is just a, a, an RTA and, and nothing more. So when the crash site had been found and they'd ident identified that it was Stephen Jones's wife, what happened next? Officers turned up at, at his home just to console him. Um, in, many, in many ways, that, that wouldn't be uncommon because as far as they were concerned, it was just a traffic accident. The unfortunate thing for Stephen, he therefore didn't have an opportunity to get rid of the weapons that he was using, one, to attack her, and also to create this road traffic accident. So in many ways, that worked against him. By them turning up, he didn't have the opportunity to do those things because by then, the forensic officers were then at the scene looking into it, and they obviously took the view, this is not what it seems. So while they were consoling him in one breath, other officers were doing their job diligently, and that worked against him. From being the husband that's been consoled, he became the prime suspect. The thing about this case for me is understanding how, on the surface, someone can seem like a devoted family man, a top cop, but underneath the surface is a cold, calculated killer. In the days following the discovery of his wife's body, Jones had remained adamant he knew nothing about her death. A lot of times when you deal with investigations like this, there's denial by the suspect and no different uh, to Jones. He denied it uh, as long as he could, but as the evidence mounted, he realized that he couldn't stick to the denial. So after Jones had been arrested, what, what did he say under interview? What was his statement? So his initial account was that he denied all knowledge of anything. He said, as far as he knew, she'd gone out in the car and it had crashed. And the first he knew about it was when the police came to him. He said that he had nothing to do with it, denied that he'd assaulted her and killed her. The car crash theory that he'd hoped his colleagues would buy no longer held up. He was going to have to improvise. Police officer Stephen Jones had been in the cells for two weeks, denying he knew anything about his wife's death. But now, he was in the interrogation room, on the opposite side of the table. As they gather their evidence, and then they start laying it out on the table in front of him, or through his solicitor, he will start to realise that actually, it's all coming together now. Their jigsaw is being formed, and they know what's happened. And in fact, in here, I've got a statement I can show you of when he changes his story two weeks later. Have a look at that. So he changed his story from, I knew nothing about it, I'm innocent, to this. He changed it? Yep. OK, let me put my glasses on so I can read this. Following my return home from work on the night of Sunday, the 3rd of January, 1993, my wife and I had a violent quarrel downstairs. She accused me of infidelity and admitted to having an affair herself. It was a bitter, hurtful row and ended up in a struggle. My wife had picked up a hammer and in the course of the struggle, I took it from her. We both fell over and through the patio doors. I then saw she was lying still and bleeding heavily from the head. There was no sign of life and I realized that she had died. At first, I was numb. Then I panicked and decided to fake a traffic accident. I carried my wife to the car and drove, drove about for a while before deliberately driving into the wall on Tinkers. I then pulled my wife from the car and eventually walked away. I mean, it's so unbelievable, that statement. So from, from this account where he changed his story, and he mentions a lump hammer, um, that there was a struggle, how do we know that it wasn't a lump hammer that was the murder weapon, or she didn't bang her head when she fell through the patio doors? So if you remember when the pathologist comes out at the beginning on the night and he's not happy about the injuries, when he actually does the post-mortem, 
they can look and see exactly what their injury is like and they can tell you exactly what sort of weapon has caused it. And as the investigation unfolds through that first day and they discover this truncheon, the steel truncheon, you take that to the pathologist and say, what do you think about this as the murder weapon? And, you know, I've done it myself where I've taken different weapons, some that I was convinced was a murder weapon to the pathologist and said, what about this? And he's like, nope. And so you have to go away. And when you've got the right one, he'll tell you how and why it's the right one. So they're pretty sure it wasn't the lump hammer. It wasn't the fall on the patio. It was definitely that steel truncheon that did it. But what drove him to such a horrendous crime when he must have known that there was every chance that he wouldn't get away with it? Nicknamed the Bull because of his six foot one, 19 stone frame, Jones had been in the force for 17 years and had an exemplary record. So why do seemingly good cops turn bad? What's it like for you to investigate a cop that you know is a criminal? So that's probably one of the most challenging bits of policing, and for two reasons. One, you don't want to believe that they're a criminal. Nobody wants to believe that police officers are criminals. So I think that's quite difficult for the whole of policing and the public to get over, as well as individuals. And then on the flip side, you want to know that if they are a criminal, you don't want them anywhere near your police force. And so you've got to be absolutely focused on getting to the truth. So if we look at the case here with Stephen Jones, for example, what is he like as a, as a cop and a criminal? At the very beginning, no one thinks he's a criminal. Madeline and Stephen Jones had been married for 13 years. They had two sons together and on the surface had a wonderful marriage. What was going on behind the scenes? Psychologist Serena Simmons is going to help me get into the mind of a murderer. What sort of a man would you say Stephen Jones is? He's a man with um, an incredibly fragile ego, I think, to start with. He um, really wanted to portray the right kind of character in his job. He wanted to climb the ranks. He was really intent on presenting a really um, together profile of who he was in his career and with his family. So he wanted that family set up and it was really important that people knew he was a good husband and father maybe behind the scenes. But actually there's a really fragile ego underneath all of that behavior that we actually see. Something that wasn't seen but came out in court was that Stephen Jones had been having an affair with a woman half his age. And this was something that he'd been determined to keep secret. We found out that he was having an affair with a 17-year-old barmaid from his local pub and he'd been having that affair with her for about the last 18 months, so that was prior to him going on to then kill his wife. So again, just that kind of person that thinks they can keep that part of their life separate, it's hidden, he can get away with it, and also he's entitled to do it, so there's very much a sense of entitlement in his behaviour and that's why he really kind of groomed that relationship. I think he thought he could keep that affair on the quiet. Do you think there was an element of what Stephen Jones did here, that he didn't want to give up that public, public persona or public perception? Go back to that person where the community knows who he is, um, people look up to him, respect him, he's this pillar of the community, essentially. But to be divorced no longer presents this family man status. Right. And there's another question as well, is... Why kill your wife? There's other options, and you just think, what? This is your wife, you know, the mother of your children. Why didn't he take the other option and, and have a conversation and say, it's not working anymore, you know, like most people do? Why did he go to that extent? Well, again, you're showing to have a rational mind, which is amazing. That's what most normal people would do. They think, you know, this isn't working. How can I logically work through this with my partner and come to a conclusion where we're all happy and the kids are going to be okay but someone like him who again we don't know enough about their relationship but I'm getting a sense that they were really maybe quite unhappy behind the scenes right. and for him it was simpler in his brain to get rid of her just to remove the issue 
But again, you have to remember that that's paired with the kind of arrogance he had because he thought he would get away with it. He just wanted to remove the issue, remove the problem, and he thought he could do that. But it wasn't just an affair that Jones had kept secret. There was another powerful motive, money. So as the police start to investigate all the circumstances now around Jones and what he's done, they discover that in 1992, so less than a year earlier, he's taken out a life insurance policy on his wife that's worth £60,000 if she dies in an accident. So is that, is that quite common then for you, for you as an investigator to come up against people that, that have committed murder um, for financial gain? It's much more common than people realise that pressures of finance, so either the fact that they don't have any money, they owe a lot of money, or they could come into a lot of money as a result of killing a partner, is a big influence on people and their decision making. And in particular, I think with police officers, they feel really vulnerable if they haven't got that financial stability because it undermines them and how they're presented in their community and, you know, they should be in a position of strength financially. How often is it for police officers or cops going from good to bad when money is the influence behind that? I think there's two things that make police officers corrupt and money is a really big, significant one. And it doesn't always result in killing. You know, it can be working with organised crime groups. It can be right. even as little as shoplifting. And then the other one is always around sexual motives and preying on vulnerable women for sexual gratification. They're the two key things when you look at corrupt cops. Stephen Jones, though, he gets, gets out insurance on his wife and then she dies in an accident shortly after. It seems obvious that he wasn't going to get away with it. And with hindsight, it's great, isn't it? Because we now know the answers to all those questions. Yeah. If you turn it on its head, though, he's taken that life insurance policy out a year earlier. It wasn't just a couple of weeks right, earlier. Right, right. He's obviously thought about this for a while, and are there other ways to get out of his marriage? And he couldn't. And then we know that he's planned this murder and so it's actually gone on for quite a long period of time, this planning. But in his mind, because he's done it over a long period of time, he probably thought he had all bases covered. He thinks because he's a respected figure in the community, he's going to get away with it. But his arrogance and narcissism is his fatal flaw. So we obviously now know that Stephen Jones had a darker side. So um, Jones has been able to kind of bring everyone into his world of being this loving, caring father, a great police officer, and coaching the young kids in football. But his thinking behind the scenes is very dark. That, that side of who he is is kept very, very secret. Um, and that's what he's kind of deferring to when he's thinking about what he's going to do to his wife. Again, it takes a certain kind of person to go, I don't want to be with her anymore, she's in the way. Mm. I'm going to kill her. He'd been thinking about it for quite some time. I, I do feel like there was probably moments when he fantasised about doing it and thought about what he could do, because not all elements of the orchestrated part of the murder make sense. She ran downstairs, and when she entered the garage, he hit her over the head. I think he was maybe surprised at the amount of blood that that produced. Um, and that maybe made him panic a little bit. I've worked with offenders where actually, quite surprisingly, you often ha are helping them deal with the murder itself because they are quite shocked at what has happened. Mm. Things like the blood, the smells, the sounds, the things that you don't think of that cause a certain level of trauma, believe it or not, in the individual. It's quite likely that it didn't go to plan in terms of this really simple, get rid of her and then I'll kind of do something with the body. But the level, you know, the blood was that kind of indication that there was a bit more of a panic going on and that he had then had to try and hide it. He was worried about the effects that divorce might have on his promotion prospects because he was an ambitious uh, officer who wanted to become an inspector and rise up through the ranks. So he was concerned there about how that might be viewed. The mistakes that Jones had made were all there for the detectives to find. Now the cops felt that they had enough for a conviction. 
But would the jury agree? In January 1993, it had taken the police hours to realise that Madeline Jones's death wasn't the result of a tragic accident, but was in fact murder. Her police officer husband, Stephen Jones, had brutally murdered her at home and then staged the accident, but he'd botched it. I'm looking at this, this footage here of the car. Obviously looks like it's been in a big crash, you know, the windscreen's damaged and it's hit the tree and all that, but... I mean, how stupid. I mean, he's, he's a police officer, he's been around crimes. He didn't even put the seat back. His seat was for a six foot one guy and his Madeline was four foot 11. He made so many mistakes. I mean, he thought it through, but he didn't think it through. I just think, how stupid can you be? I'm glad he was stupid, because that's what got him caught. The pathologist had ruled that Madeline had died of blunt force trauma which police believed had happened in the garage of their home. Do you think he thought he would get away with this because he was a copper? I think there's no doubt the fact that he was um, in the police at the time made him think he was invincible and that he thought it out and he would get away with it. How does that make you feel uh, as a police officer yourself? I find it really quite sickening because there's so many good people in policing who work really, really hard to do the best they can. And then you get these rotten apples abusing all their power and using their inside knowledge and that cover of his uniform, his police car, to go and plan what he thinks is then going to be a perfect crime. As a police officer, you're quite annoyed um, to think that when you should be out there serving the public, yeah, doing the, the right thing, policing, as you do day to day, but you are more fixated on killing someone, like your wife or someone close to you. Of course, as a police officer, you, you, you're incensed by that, but unfortunately, police officers are just like other human beings. They will sometimes have their own agendas about whatever it may be. So I kind of take the view that it's sad, it's upsetting for a police officer to have done something like that. But we don't live in an ideal world, and unfortunately, there will be some officers who will um, abuse their position, their knowledge, their experience as being a police officer in order to do something that we would describe as heinous. For all his calculated planning, he still made so many mistakes. Those mistakes are made because at the time of committing an offence like that, you're always worried about someone turning up unannounced. So you're always trying to do something as quickly as possible. And you can plan for what you're going to do, but when, they, when, when it actually happens, and he had to therefore try and recreate that scene, he knew that time was always against him. There was always a, a possibility someone could have drove past and seen what was happening. So I think those things were probably playing on his mind. He wasn't thinking it through. He thought he had created the ideal scenario with the road traffic accident. In the end, time was a factor. You can imagine his shock when the police rock up on his doorstep within an hour of the accident, because I'm sure that he thought he would have a bit more time. So time to get himself cleaned up, time to decide how he was going to dispose of the evidence that currently was sat in the back of his car, time to check that there was no signs of any blood. He would be on the back foot. And I can imagine intense panic inside him but on the outside, portraying this calm, collected, oh, I'm really shocked, that's a terrible thing to happen, how has that happened? And his mind was probably worrying about, well, if they're going to start accusing me of stuff now, what story am I going to come up with? So all the lies and deceit had finally caught up with Stephen Jones. This former hero cop, a respected figure in his community, had become the very thing he'd sworn to protect the public against. In your experience, is this very uncommon for, for a man to kill his wife in this way? No, I wouldn't say it, it was. Um, as an investigator, I've dealt with other cases where um, domestic violence, where the husband's attacked the wife and the, the injuries have been significant um, to the individual concern. The surprising thing for me is, is that he was a police officer and he could bring himself to doing something like that. 
That's, that's the, the bit that I kind of struggle with because he's there to protect. He would have arrested probably people for domestic violence and then to then do exactly that type of thing, um, I just find it difficult to sort of comprehend at times. What I find hard to believe as well is that he was hailed a hero because apparently he saved a lady who was drowning in a lake, freezing cold, and just not so long before. So it's hard to comprehend. Well, that's why I say it's hard to comprehend because he would have done the right thing, saving someone's life, but in the same breath, he was happy to take someone's life. On the 16th of November, 1993, Stephen Jones went on trial for the murder of his wife. The trial was held at Carnarvon Crown Court on the other side of North Wales. The judge, Mr Justice Kennedy, heard that Jones, who has two young sons, had taken out extra life insurance for his wife and had been having a passionate affair. He feared the effect a divorce would have on his promotion prospects. So when it came to the trial, what happened there? Uh, the jury were out for just over three hours, which is very quick. It could normally take three, four, five days. So that tells you one thing, that the evidence was, was damning. Um, and then the judge, obviously, in, in his um, summing up about the case, he obviously appreciated that this was a, a police officer who had a lot of knowledge and experience and was trying to use that knowledge and experience in order to evade being found out. And therefore, that would have been reflected in the sentence that was imposed afterwards. Well, the judge just mentioned, he said, you know, this was a wicked, wicked offence for which you've been convicted. So in other words, he's saying, you know, you've done evil, you're a police officer, and that would be reflected in how I'm going to sentence you later on. He was making it blatantly clear to him and to anybody else in that courtroom, you know, that what he did was wicked, it was evil, and therefore the, the, the sentence was going to be reflected by that. On the 25th of November, 1993, Stephen Jones was sentenced to life imprisonment. As an ex-policeman heading into the prison community, he could expect a warm welcome. I think people felt that justice had been done. I think people felt that the police had done a good job. The forensic experts had produced all the evidence that there was no doubt about the way that this crime had been carried out. Uh, I spoke to his family afterwards and they they felt very bitter, they felt angry, and of course they were absolutely stricken with grief. Uh, and I'm sure that even today, it's one of those things that will, it will stay with them, will haunt them for the rest of their lives. Since then, police procedure has been standardized to ensure all fatal road accidents are investigated properly. Most police forces around the UK will now have a forensic collision team. So they will be officers who have got the expertise and the knowledge to investigate road traffic accidents where somebody dies, as compared to uh, constables turning up at a scene of a uh, road traffic accident where someone has died, and they probably only got three, six months between them. They wouldn't have the knowledge and expertise in order to investigate those matters. So that was a good um, example of learning from what had happened. It was a betrayal of his sisters and brothers in blue when he decided to cross the line and become a killer. And for what? Money? Love? The idea of a new life? Only he will know his true motives. In the end, this wicked murderer, Stephen Jones, was brought to justice, proving him to be a monster, masquerading as a hero. Now, <laughs> 
Oh, 
Eu vou falar a uma aba moça. Se eu entrasse de nós, não ia te seguir logo na nerfa de vez na Willy, mas eu se for. Oxe, não é só um dos meus, se não é bem, não é? Se não é fiel, 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 se não é Mas como assim? Ai, que chaves que já se não há finido de fialbos a se fazer para ver o nó de nada. E eu disse não, 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 não. Hoje, para dar-me de desistir, de me 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 desistir, Se não 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 se Nel dam fi albzi vei not de stabet. Hier fis ne anis ne ani ro inaj de vedet, no me ir bis nof mesta. Rgis kaj de ni dah si vei aj blu kseda. Jaz jam bis ne aj blu ne aj vona. Iz ne bis blu ne pza pza. Iz ne bis ne bis blu ne aj nof ga zioni. Ali poh pjevi vas se pjevi ne hval vrom fjev mas no re bis ne pza ve ve hez. Das Lehrs, wie es wieder in der Mächte wieder hat, auf der Frau, das ist wirklich, sie sind so ein bisschen, und wir haben es auch gefragt, wie es war, wo es ist, nicht noch nicht, 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 nicht no